Friends, it is so good to be back home. It was, it was an exhausting trip. It was good to go and celebrate birthdays with the moms. But going up and seeing the family and all the kids and grandkids and all that, oh my gosh, we got so worn out. We're glad to be back home. And uh, Annette got behind on some of her schoolwork because of all the traveling, but uh, she's at home getting that taken care of, and she's with us in spirit. But uh, tonight's message comes to us out of the book of Mark, and we're continuing on from where we had been. You know, we, we talked about the three different uh, weeks about Jesus' kingship, and then uh, uh, Pastor Larry spoke to us last week about uh, King Herod hearing about Jesus and him thinking he might be uh, John the Baptist being uh, uh, resurrected because he had just had him put to death. And so this week we're going to hear more about uh, what Jesus is doing, preaching and teaching. But a curious thing is happening here in Mark. Uh, as, as Mark is telling it, you know, he's, he, this is the action book. This is all about what Jesus did. It's, it's action. Bang, bang, bang. Jesus is doing stuff. And in this week's reading at the end of chapter 6 here, it's kind of curious what the lectionary did. And so I want to speak to that for a second. The lectionary is going to have Jesus speaking with his disciples when they come back. Remember he sent them out two by two two weeks ago? He sent them out two by two. Don't take anything with you. Just leave your iPad and your, your flip chart at home and just go and spread the word and preach and teach and heal people in my name. Okay, well this week he's going to come back and they're going to visit with him about that and kind of share with him what they learned and what they did. And then the reading is going to skip. If you'll notice it up there in the readings, it has a few verses, then it skips a bunch, and it has a few more. In the bunch that it skips are two of the miracle stories we're most familiar with. So I just want to spend a minute and talk about those. The first one's feeding the 5,000. And I find it, it is curious that, that we're gonna, the lectionary is skipping those two this year in Mark, but remember this time after Pentecost is uh, we're studying about what it means to be disciples and what our discipleship is supposed to look like and be like. And so Mark is going to keep us in the action parts, but he's skipping two of the most well-known uh, 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 miracle stories. The lectionary is, I mean, not Mark. Mark doesn't skip them. But I, I wanted to just demonstrate to, for you just for a second that, you know, the disciples say, you know, these people, we need to send them away because one, we want to just visit with you, Jesus, about what we just went and did. And it's late in the evening, and they probably don't have anything to eat. And Jesus says, well, y'all feed them. And they go like, it would take eight months' pay to be able to feed this many people. Well, let's put that in perspective. Eight months' pay is about 240 days. And a denarii, you remember, a denarii is the, the, the increment of money that generally speaks to one day's work. So about 240 denarii, give or take a few, during that time is what they're talking about. It would cost to feed this multitude. Well, one denarii would buy a loaf of bread. It would buy 12, actually buy 12 loaves of bread. And a loaf of bread, the ancient measurement, was about a half an inch thick and seven or eight inches in diameter. About the size of this right here. It's pretty close to the size of what an ancient piece of bread would have been. And one denarii would buy about 12 pieces. So... When Jesus is out there, and he says, well, what have you got? And they went and got the little boy, right? And he had two loaves of bread and five little fishes. Now, eight months worth of pay would have bought about 2,500 of these. And they fed 5,000. But the boy had two. So imagine two of these being multiplied and split up to feed those. And that was 5,000 men. Doesn't, they're not counting the women and the children that must have been there, so there could have been 15, 20,000 people easy. Just saying. And then the second miracle was when uh, Jesus told them, y'all go on ahead and go on over to the other side, and I'll catch up with you. I'm going to go pray and get rid of these people. And remember, they're going, he's, they're going across the water there overnight. And it's the fourth watch. It's like the watches are every three hours. So the first watch is 6 to 9, then 9 to 12, 12 to 3, and then 3 to 6 in the morning is the fourth watch. They're going across the water. Here comes Jesus strolling across the water, and they kind of freak out. 
Okay, now in Mark, he doesn't have Peter come walk out on the water because Peter uh, was the, uh, uh, Mark is written more from Peter's perspective and Peter's trying to be a little modest because Peter never felt like he was worthy of everything that Christ gave him. So uh, uh, Mark tends to minimize the things that Peter did. But those two miracles of the feeding the 5,000 and Jesus walking on water are left out of tonight's readings. But I just want to tell you that they're in there because when you go home and you read this scripture story for yourself, you'll see the parts that uh, uh, were left out. And I just wanted to address those. But let's go ahead and read today's readings. And then uh, I'll try to fill in some gaps and make it relevant to us now. We're going to be in the book of Mark, chapter 6. We're going to pick up reading in verse 30 to 34, and then we'll jump over to 53. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw such a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Then we jump over to verse 53. And it says, When they had crossed over, they landed at Genesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or the countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. God's gospel message for God's people. Thanks be to God indeed. Okay. The Roman world that Jesus is in right here. People are supposed to do and be and say what the Romans tell them. If the Romans say that you're, you're, this is peace, this is peace. Doesn't matter if you're heavily taxed. Doesn't matter if you can't say what you really want to say. Doesn't matter if you can't do what you really want to do. What matters is the government is saying, oh, we're at peace, be happy, and pay your taxes, or else. And there was no provision in any of that for the people's hurts, for the tough times people were going through. Never know mind that their little hard scrabble piece of land was barely producing enough for their family, that they also had to pay taxes on that, and some, oftentimes that took a substantial portion of what they planted and harvested, and they didn't have enough for their family. And heaven forbid somebody be sick. Remember a couple weeks ago we talked about the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, and the doctors were quacks. So you didn't go to a doctor. You hoped God would heal you because the, the chief priests are saying, you must be a sinner if you're afflicted with illness because if you weren't sick, if you, if, if you weren't a sinner, then God wouldn't afflict you because that's the way they believed back then. And so here's Jesus going through the countryside, teaching and preaching and healing, except in his own hometown, remember? Because in your own hometown, you know, when you get the good news, and you want to go share it with your family and friends, the people you know best? And then they say, yeah, right, I know you. I know all about you. Don't give me that. That's what happened to Jesus, too, so we shouldn't be too surprised when it happens to us. But here's Jesus teaching and preaching and healing, and people are hearing about it. Word spreading. Jesus and the disciples were just trying to do a little debrief here on their time going out and healing and teaching and Jesus just wanted to know how it went. They wanted to share it with him. They wanted to get a little rest. But yet, they're inundated with people. And Jesus had compassion on the crowds because Jesus saw their need. See, Jesus could see the hearts of all those people. And he knew that they were hurting. They were in desperate need of one thing or another. Each one of them needed something. Even the ones who were carrying others on mats the bearers, the people carrying, they had needs too. And so for us, as modern 20, 21st century post-resurrection Christians, we got it all together, right? I mean, we're doing okay. We got a roof, we got clothes, we got food, we got a car. Life is good. We're doing okay most of the time. 
At least that's what we put out there. That's the image we give out. And we rarely share just how bad we're really hurting inside. But here was a whole throng of people that came because they're going against the grain here because good decorum would say, don't go just interrupt somebody that seems to be they're busy. Don't just go bum rushing them and crowding them up. But that's what they were doing. So they weren't exercising politeness, but they were responding to their need to take it before someone who they had come to understand could help them with that. And so in our modern context, what do we do if people suddenly show up in need? Well, on the one hand, we probably don't have to worry about it too much because these days if people are hurting or sick or something, they're probably going to go to a therapist or a doctor or go to the gym or go do something else besides come to church. Right? I think that's a kind of a sad truth. How many of us come to church believing that where we're going and when we're here, that this is a place where people could come to get healed? We may think it on some temporal level, but do we really believe that in our hearts? And would we stop what we're doing? Would we interrupt our recreation time or our relaxing time or our recovering time to go help somebody in need. That's what Jesus modeled for us today. As disciples, that's what we hear. That's what the story's telling us today. So as I was trying to process through, okay, why would the lectionary leave out these two known special miracles? So I concentrated on the first part and the last part. And what it reveals are striking images and messages to us about what we're supposed to do as disciples, as people carrying God's Word and living God's uh, uh, image here in the, in the world. And that is to show compassion to others in need. Now, we do that as a church with our participation through Hope South Florida and through the food pantry. You're seeing the, the fruits of some of those labors that Patrick and Donna are heading up, you know, to do. And the kids are part of and the backpacks and everything we're doing. We do, we do some stuff. But we also realize that no matter what we do or how much of it we do, there are always going to be things we can't get to. That's just a realization. And even in this case, do you think that the people that came to Jesus were the only people in that area that needed help? I doubt it. There were people that maybe they couldn't get there. There might have been people that maybe didn't believe. There's a thousand and one reasons why people didn't come. But the truth of the matter is, the ones that did come weren't the only ones. Just like the ones that we reach out and serve through our mission and ministries aren't the only people who need help help and encouragement and love and support through their own illnesses and hurts and worries. I think all of us come to church hoping that today, today, we're going to get a word that's somehow going to lift us up. Today we're going to get something that's going to make us feel better. Today we're going to get something that makes us feel a little closer to God. And I hope all of that's true every week. I really do. But some weeks, some weeks it probably doesn't exactly happen. Not at the time we're right here at church. It might come a little bit later. It might come when we're reading Scripture at home alone. It might come when we're doing something just at random to help somebody because we were right there and they needed it. We did it. We're called to do all that too. But I want you to note the intentionality here. Jesus was trying to secure a time and place for the disciples to rest and get a bite and relax. And they were inundated by others in greater need than themselves. And they responded to that. So while Jesus at first was highlighting the fact that we, we need replenishment sometimes too, when we go out and do God's work, we pour ourselves out for the sake of ministry, mission and ministry, we need our time back with God and our own recreating place and time. 
But we shouldn't confuse with that time when we're supposed to be recreating or we've set aside to do that for ourselves, that if God doesn't present us with some other people or somebody in need, that we shouldn't respond to that and trust that God's going to give us what we need to both tend to them and to have our own recreation uh, of our, our spirit and our, our soul and replenishment that we need, whether it's physical, emotional, or mental. Okay? And then he speaks to uh, uh, the people who uh, uh, are there, at the disciples where they're trying to tell them, and, and Jesus says, okay, now y'all, we've taken care of feeding these people. Y'all go over to the other place. And so when they get over there, there's more people showing up. It didn't happen just once. It happens again. So what do we draw from that? They're on one side of the lake, trying to get some rest. Bam, there's all the people. They feed them. And Jesus says, now, y'all go to the other side, and I'll meet you up over there. And Jesus is going to dismiss the people. And he does whatever he does. And he walks across the water, catches up with them, and then rides the rest, rest of the way with them. And when they get over there, more people. So what does it mean that wherever Jesus goes with the disciples, people are showing up in need? And what does it tell us today about when we gather with Jesus, fellowship with each other, and people in need show up? Or what does it tell us when people in need don't show up? What does that mean? And that's a great segue into the cards. Folks, we know that the world's hurting out there. Every week, I ask you to go out and be the hands and feet of Christ to a world that we know is in desperate need of His love. And I believe that you all do it to the best of your ability when the occasions reveal themselves. But we need to do more because I have, when I read the part, uh, I read a commentary that said something about our, our churches today really cognizant about people outside the church not really seeing inside the church as being a place of healing. That troubled me. And it should trouble you. So what do we do about that? I mean, all of us have stories about different times in our lives where we were hurting, where somebody within the body of Christ was there for us in a moment or for a long number of moments, whatever the case may be. But we knew and we know that we can get some of this healing for whatever we might need in different ways and different times from the body of Christ. But how do we communicate that to people that don't know that? I think that the only way they're going to find out is by coming and rubbing elbows with us, pandemic or no pandemic, to be here, to fellowship, to get to know us, to see us, to allow us a chance to be Christ's disciples to people. It's not enough for us to be disciples with and among each other. We need that to keep each other accountable, sure enough but we also need to be inviting others into the gospel, the good news, what Jesus came for. See, the world is telling people, just do what we tell you to do. Say what we tell you to say, and you will be fine. But we all know better than that. We all know that life brings stuff. It brings grief. It brings remorse. It brings injury. It brings illness. It brings a whole variety of maladies that affect us in different and sometimes dramatic ways. And the government and people outside of the church don't really have a program for that. They don't. And we know we do. We know Jesus does. So are we going to be like the ancient Israelites and just kind of Huddle it up and keep it for ourselves? Keep our church secret and private? Or are we going to go?
go out there and boldly go where no Christian's gone before and take our cards. Say, I got something for you. Check it out. It's a great place. You can find love there. You can find acceptance there. You can find hope there. You can find grace there. It's in the name, see? Grace. You can find that there. And you can find people that will be happy to share with you their own experiences of grief and loss and injury and illness and can help point you to a place where you can come back from that. Because see, Jesus taught biblical truths. He taught the truths of God. And along the way, He healed some people. But the people came and listened. You know, the healing only took just a few minutes, right? Boom, touch the cloak, you're you're good. Touch the forehead, you're good. Smack on the hand, you're good, whatever. But Jesus taught. People were enraptured by what He said, and they listened. Where does this man get these words? Who is this man that knows all these truths of God? That's what they said about Jesus. There's something about real truth that speaks to our hearts. And people recognize real truth when they hear it. And if we're right, that we're following Jesus and God the way Scriptures tell us, the best of our ability, and we're right that God has called us all out to start this new church and to be an active, living, breathing body of Christ in this community. And if we're right, that God is blessing us for doing that, then with those blessings comes a test. That's biblical too, by the way. Every time God blessed the nation of Israel came a test. What are you going to do with this? So what are we going to do with it? Are we going to invite people to come join us? Are we going to do it over and over and over and over and over and over until people come? Because we're, going to, we're a praying church. We're a worshiping church. We're a Bible studying church. Can we be an inviting church too? I mean, Mimi is reaching out to bring youth in, doing different activities with the kids. Patrick and Donna are doing things where we can be actively engaged to reach out to take uh, uh, food to the hungry and the working poor and the needy in our community. We have the blessing of Fred being in our midst that Hope South Florida is down the road Hope South Florida is a testimonial, a living testimonial. What one person willing to step out in faith can do when leveraged with God's blessing over and over and over and over. That's what grew Hope South Florida. We've got evidence all around us of activity. So can we leverage that for more? Can we do a little more, just a little more? Five cards worth this week? See, I believe that if what we're doing is true and right, and I believe it is, seekers are looking for truth. The whole world is filled with people out there that are in need, that are hurting, that are wondering where they're going to get what they need because they're not getting it where they are, whatever that means for them. And if we think we can offer up some of that hope here, then I'd submit that truth will bring seekers. God's truth will bring people here. All we got to do is be the disciples that God's calling us to be. To love people when they come in the door. To show them what repentant lives look like. To show them what redeemed lives look like. And how God's redemptive work is happening every day over and over and over in the lives of His people as well as those who haven't experienced it yet. It's there, ready. And those of us who live by that grace and who live for that daily redemption are here to share it with open arms, to welcome others here to share in it. So let us do that. This week, five cards. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.